So good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to have this opportunity to talk to you. As Professor MacDonald explained, I want to talk a little bit about how the heart works, the issues that can occur with the heart that lead, it, that lead to the development of a condition we call heart failure, and perhaps even more importantly, what we can do to try and prevent that. One thing I want to do first of all is dispel a few of the uh, common misconceptions about the heart, which this is just for a bit of fun, but this is the sort of thing I often ask an audience when doing a talk, and it's interesting to see how many misconceptions there are. So the first one relates to the size of the heart. Now, because of the limitation of the way we're doing this this evening, I can't hear your response. But if you take my word for it, usually when we ask people this, about 50% will get the size of the heart correct, and the other 50% will grossly overestimate how big it is. So you, you often get people who think the heart occupies almost the entire chest cavity. In actual fact, the heart is about the size of a human fist. And actually, more accurately, if you, if you clench your two hands together, you get an even better sense of the width, the height, and also, also the depth of the heart. Um, it's actually a pretty compact organ. And given what it does, it's pretty remarkable. It does it for the size that it is. Another common misconception, even more common misconception about the heart is where it is in the body. Uh, if, if you ask this question of people, they will almost always pick box six as the location of the heart. They, there's a tendency to feel that it's out on the left side of the chest cavity. In actual fact, the heart is right in the centre. Now, because of the shape of the heart and because of the way it lies in the chest cavity, there's a little tendency for it to edge slightly to the left, but the bulk of the heart is very much in the centre of the, of, of the chest cavity. The heart's a truly remarkable organ, uh, and I'm just, just, to, just to exemplify that, I'm going to show, show you a few numbers. So if we were to look at the number of heartbeats that, that, that occur in one day, if we assume that someone's heart beats, for example, 80 times per minute, which would be a pretty normal uh, number of beats per minute, and given that there are 60 minutes uh, in one hour and 24 hours in a day, we end up having 115,000 or just over 115,000 beats in one day. And again, if you ask people this, they will guess in the thousands, but usually not as high as 115,000. If we then look at someone who's, say, 80 years of age, and given that they have 115 or just over 115,000 beats in a day, you end up with, at the age of 80, having a heart that is beaten 3.3 billion times. It's an extraordinary number. Uh, and as a human civilization, we've created some great engineering, but there's very little that can compare with the efficiency of the heart. And for the majority of people, most of the time, it does this without ever having a rest. It's an extraordinary organ. That's why, this is why we do what we do. The heart, in terms of its function, well, we can look at it as cardiologists in very different ways, but primarily it's there as a pump. And this is what everyone knows about the heart, that it's this very, very important pump. If we got a little more technical, we would describe it as really being two pumps, a left and a right pump. But for the sake of simplicity and the sake, for the sake of what I want to describe tonight, we'll think of it as just one simple pump. And again, if we had engineering friends here, they would tell us that it's the type of pump that we would call an intermittent pump. And that would be different to a continuous pump. So if you turn your tap on at home, you know that the water just keeps flowing continuously. There's no stopping and starting and stopping and starting. The heart, therefore, is an intermittent pump. It stops and it starts in terms of creating flow of blood. And we can make a great analogy with a foot pump. So as you know, with a foot pump, in order, or order for that to work, someone has to press their foot on the foot pump to press the lever down to drive the flow of air out of the foot pump and into the car tire. But just as importantly as that, it's necessary for the, the, the pump to relax again, to come up and fill with air so that it's primed for the next squeezing action. And those two, those two aspects of an intermittent pump are really important. So there's the action of pressing down and there's the action of releasing to fill up again. If anything were to go wrong with either one of those things, the foot pump, it's the mechanism that the, the action of the foot pump will be compromised. So for example, you could imagine someone who comes along to use a foot pump whose leg is a little weaker, maybe they're feeling tired and they don't push it down enough, maybe they only push it halfway down. You intuitively guess that that would affect the overall efficiency of the way the foot pump would then operate. Uh, similarly, you could push the foot pump down normally, but there could be an issue with the way in which the foot pump comes up to fill for the next round. Perhaps there's some rust in the foot pump. And again, you, even though you're pushing it down well, you can imagine that if it's not, if it's not relaxing properly, if there's trouble with, with the foot pump coming back up to fill up, that's also going to compromise the efficiency in the, of, the, of, of the foot pump. Uh, and exactly the same thing happens with the heart. Two, two broad 
categories of, of issue can happen with the way in which the heart pumps. So on the one hand, the heart might not squeeze very well, and on the other hand, the heart might not relax very well. And when, when this takes place, it can cause problems in the body. It can cause people to start experiencing symptoms. And we call this combination, this combination of issues with either the squeeze or the relaxation of the heart, coupled with difficulties that a person experiences, symptoms, we call this condition heart failure. And as Professor MacDonald uh, suggested in his talk, it's an old-fashioned name. We, we, we still use it for very sensible reasons so that we're all on the same page, but we don't really like to emphasize that word. And part of the reason for that is that we're in a great day and age now where we, where we, where we can treat this condition uh, very effectively. But if we're looking to see if someone has heart failure, or even to see if they have early signs of changes, we need a way of looking inside of the heart. And the best way to look inside of something is to cut it open. Um, so I'll show you. There, there we go. So the best way to look inside the heart is to cut it open. And if we cut open an apple, for example, if we just slice it down the middle, we can see exactly what's going on inside. Now, we wouldn't uh, be as cruel uh, and, and unusual as to do that to an actual person, but we can actually slice the heart in a, in a sort of invisible way. We can do it by using sound waves. And I'll explain a little bit about how this works, because patients often ask this when we, when we, we scan their heart, how is this working? It, it's a very interesting uh, technology. It's, it basically uses sound waves. So we send sound waves out. And you can imagine if you were st stood at the top of the Grand Canyon and you were to shout your name into the Grand Canyon, about a second or two later, you would hear an echo. You'd hear the reflection of the sound coming out of your mouth, hitting off the rock and coming back again. And that time delay, that time delay between making the noise and hearing the echo gives you information about the distance, what, what's, a, what's away from you. So this technology was used during World War I. It was a way of detecting submarines. Uh, it also exists in nature. It's the way bats see. It's a, a process called echolocation. Uh, there's good reason to believe that bats do build a genuine visual image using sound instead of light. And it's also the, the, the trick that you get taught in school where you, you, you see the lightning and hear the thunder later and you do a little quick calculation to find out how far away that event is taking place. So when we do this with the heart, we get these beautiful images. Uh, unfortunately, I can't show you the video images, and these are still images, but what we actually see when we do this kind of scan is real-time video footage of your heart operating. So we can look at those two key principles, those two important uh, components of the function of the heart. We can look at how it squeezes, and we can look at how it relaxes. If there is any issue with those things, what we're interested in is whether or not a patient has symptoms from them. And the symptoms uh, are pretty easy to, 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 to understand. You can imagine that if, if, if the heart's failing, if it's not able to keep the blood moving forward as well, well then you get a backup of pressure. And that backup of pressure occurs inside the lungs, and as a result of that, people experience breathlessness. But similarly, if you're not keeping the blood going around the body as well, then you're not nourishing all of the body tissues. And so you're left feeling tired, sleepy, low energy. And these are the key symptoms of heart failure. People experience breathlessness and fatigue. In addition, the heart has to push fluid to the kidneys. And you, you all know that the kidneys have an important job to make urine to remove fluid from the body. And if the heart can't get the fluid to the kidneys as well, the fluid builds up inside the body. And so you end up having fluid retention and because of gravity that would tend to head down towards the ankles. So these would be the very typical symptoms of the heart failure syndrome, breathlessness, fatigue and evidence of fluid retention. Again, we can do an awful lot to treat this condition in this day and age and it would be true to say that we've a, a, a greater, uh, we've a greater uh, uh, we've greater options for treating the form of heart failure that, that exists because of difficulty with squeezing than with, with relaxing. Uh, and as Prof Professor MacDonald was talking about, this unit is uh, very keenly engaged in, in, in research to look for new novel therapies that can help with the form of heart failure that comes about because of poor relaxation. So the other thing we can do as well as look inside the heart, and Professor MacDonald uh, explained this to you, is we can do a simple blood test uh, that we call BMP. There's some variations on it, but for the sake of simplicity, we'll call it BMP. And this is a wonderful blood test, not only to help us diagnose heart failure when we suspect it in people, but more importantly, it's a really good blood test that lets us get a sense of the risk, of, the risk that a person has of developing heart failure if they have some risk factors for that to take place. 
So again, people who have hypertension, so that's high blood pressure, and diabetes, a, a modestly raised BMP, the simple blood test, would suggest to us that the heart failure syndrome is emerging, doesn't mean the person has it. And that's really important information for us to know because as I'm now going to explain, there are things we can do to try and slow the progress and even hopefully stop the development of heart failure. So I'll talk a little bit about, about that now, how we can go about pre preventing it. Many of the prevention strategies are the things I'm sure all of you know, the lifestyle changes and the lifestyle changes that make a difference to reducing your risk of developing heart failure don't just reduce your risk of developing heart failure, they reduce your risk of heart disease in general and many other diseases. These are really important things and I'm sure all of you know them, everybody does now, but it's worth going over them again. So the first one I'll talk about is exercise. In reality, I'm always dubious about quoting too many numbers of people because if people do more than the numbers, there's a tendency to cut back. If people don't do as much as the numbers, they tend to give up. But look, for what it's worth, we, 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 we like to see people do at least 150 minutes of brisk walking uh, per week. And you can break that down in several ways. That might be just over 20 minutes a day every day, or it might be 30 minutes a day for five days of the week. But clearly, I'm sure you know this without uh, me having to tell you, the more you can do, the better. Uh, there's always going to be people who find it difficult to even do, say, 20 to 30 minutes of exercise per day. And there's very legitimate reasons for this. People can have issues with their hip joints. They can have back pain or arthritis. But nonetheless, any amount of exercise you can do substantially decreases the risk of the development of heart failure by various mechanisms, not just a direct effect of exercise, but exercise tends to improve other risk factors, things like high blood pressure and high cholesterol. The other th next thing I want to talk about is diet. Diet is, is, is always a complicated one, but a well-balanced diet is very important. And generally, we like to see about a third of your intake coming from what we would call starchy carbohydrates, potatoes, rice, pasta, and that sort of thing. The good old-fashioned advice, which is still true today, is try and get five portions of fruit and vegetables uh, every day. The other important thing, and you all know this, is to try and cut down on the sugary foods. So this is, these are the sugars and fizzy drinks, alcoholic drinks, the sugary breakfast cereals, and this sort of thing. And also try and reduce saturated fats. So they're the fats that you will find in things like hard cheeses, cakes and biscuits, uh, sausages, cream and butter as well. And very importantly, reducing salt intake uh, has a significant impact on your development of heart disease, primarily because it helps to reduce your blood pressure. Alcohol is always a tricky one. I guess when, when people come to see us, what they really want to hear from us is you can drink alcohol and all will be well. It's not possible to do that. I often make the analogy with crossing a road. Clearly, if you, if you try to cross a motorway blindfolded, you, you're asking for trouble. But if you try to cross a road at a pedestrian crossing, the green man's showing, you look left and right, and the cars have come to a stop, actually, it's pretty low risk. You can't say that it will be fine, but it's pretty low risk. And this is the way we approach alcohol. If we were having this chat a few years ago, we'd be telling you that if you're a man, you can have up to 21 units uh, per week. And if you're a woman, you could have uh, 14 units per week. Things have changed and actually things have changed in a, in a curious way because different countries now have different guidelines. The ones I put up here, purely because it's visually attractive, it, it, it's a nice, nice slide, uh, actually come from the UK. So the HSE guidelines in Ireland say that uh, it's 11 units max per week for a woman and 17 units for a man. Uh, it, it's a very curious thing because if you were to hop on the train at Connolly and go up to Belfast for the day, actually women would be allowed three units more at 14 and men would be, get three units fewer at 14. So in the UK it's 14 and 14. The guidelines in, in, in Ireland are 11 units for a woman and 17 for a man. I think the key point is don't obsess about the numbers, it's to keep it in moderation. Keep, keep it as low as you possibly can. And I think importantly, never take these limits as a challenge. So if you're drinking six units a week, don't say, oh, well, look, I can have more. Keep it in moderation. But it is true that many people, including people with established heart disease, go on to lead long, 
healthy lives enjoying alcohol. It's just important to keep it in moderation and to try and spread it out over the course of a week. Uh, and ideally try and have two, if not three days per week without any alcohol intake. Just, just to remind you when I talk about units, you, you, you probably remember uh, this sort of thing, but half a pint of a normal strength beer would be one unit, a small glass of wine uh, would be one unit, and a small glass of wine is quite a small glass of wine if you consider that a bottle has ten units, so these aren't uh, the, the, the generous kind that you get at, at, at Christmas dinner. Uh, a small shot, a small, a small measure of whiskey, that sort of thing of a spirit would also be one unit. And again, that, that's probably smaller than many people would tend to pour at home. Um, but it's very important to keep it in moderation. It's not an absolute no-no, but it is important just to be sensible about the relationship you have with alcohol. Um, the next, change that slide, sorry. Smoking, this, this, this is one which is uh, non-negotiable. Smoking, absolutely not. It is a catastrophic thing, and if you do smoke, by far one of the best things you could ever do for your health is to, is to quit smoking. Uh, there is no negotiation when it comes to smoking. Uh, this uh, website that I put on the slide here, www.quit.ie, is an outstanding resource. It's plenty of advice, hotline number. It's a fantastic thing for those of you who are struggling to quit. Uh, and your pharmacist and your GP are great resources as well. It can give you fantastic advice uh, on strategies to help you get off cigarettes, uh, advice about the use of nicotine replacement therapy but this is not unfortunately something that we can negotiate it it is always bad to, to smoke cigarettes um, so they're the sort of lifestyle things i'm going to talk now about a few of the medical conditions that also increase your risk of heart failure so high blood pressure is one high blood pressure is interesting because most people who develop high blood pressure don't know they have it so unless you're actively getting screened by perhaps popping to your GP once every 12 months or have a, a monitor at home or attending the service that we offer uh, in, in Stop HF, you may not even know you have it. Uh, it is very important because high blood pressure doesn't just increase your risk of, of heart failure, it increases your risk of many other cardiac conditions such as heart attack. It also increases your risk of stroke kidney damage, damage to the back of the eyes, and it's a very treatable thing. It's a very, very treatable thing. Uh, for those of you who are interested, we, we generally like the blood pressure to be less than 140 on 90, so many of you may be familiar with the idea that blood pressure has an upper reading and a lower reading. We like that upper reading less than 140 and the lower less than 90. Um, in addition to high blood pressure, we have diabetes. This is something that we don't necessarily actively get involved in in, in our prevention service because diabetes uh, is something that needs to be managed by a, a discrete specialist team. But for those of you who do have diabetes, take it seriously, follow the advice you're given uh, and make sure that you're getting regular attention for it, either by being managed by your GP or a specialist service uh, in a hospital. Finally then, I just want to talk a little bit about high cholesterol. Cholesterol's gotten a little bit complicated. There was a time where we uh, kind of thought it was causing all manner of problems. It certainly does cause problems, uh, but we have, to be, we have to be careful about overemphasizing it. In an otherwise healthy person with no other risk factors, a cholesterol up to say a five would, would, be, would, would be reasonable. But in the presence of other issues, we prefer it to be a bit lower than that, a bit lower than four. I don't want to say too much about the numbers because, again, I'm not a fan of obsessing about numbers. Things need to be interpreted on a case-by-case -case basis. But certainly, it, it, one important thing to know is that even with the best one in the world, with regular exercise, eating oily fish, uh, keeping your weight under control, all of those things that can help your cholesterol. Unfortunately, about 70% of the cholesterol in our body is made by the liver. And there are going to many people who will have high cholesterol despite best efforts. Uh, and that's where medication often comes in. Uh, but those sorts of things, keeping the lifestyle factors in check, and that's something you can, you can do yourselves, and we will help you with that. And then also keeping these other medical risk factors in check, these will reduce your risk of the future development of heart failure and many other many other medical conditions. So in summary then, the, the, this, this, is, this is a, a preventable condition by and large. If, if you are to develop it, it's a treatable condition. Um, and it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you this evening. This is, uh, I want to say thank you because this is our first experience uh, having a meeting like this in, in a, what we might call a virtual sense, as, as we said, of our first webinar. Uh, and it is a great pleasure and I'm very honoured that I, I, I was asked to, to speak to you this evening. And I look forward to seeing many of you again in the future, as I'm sure many of you watching I have met, met, met in the past.